Their pairing was one of the most memorable moments in cinema history. A sizzling combination of beauty and talent brought together for one extraordinary film. And for both Paul Newman and Elizabeth Taylor, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof would be a landmark in their lives and their careers. For one, a time of optimism and joy. For the other, a struggle with unspeakable tragedy. By the time Cat on a Hot Tin Roof began filming in February of 1958, both Paul Newman and Elizabeth Taylor were at a crossroads. The right film could carry them towards superstardom, but the wrong one could send them sliding backwards towards oblivion. In 1958, Elizabeth Taylor was 26 years old, and she had already been making movies for 15 years. As she matured from a preteen through her teen years, she also matured as an actress. In most of her early adult roles, however, Taylor was rarely given the chance to do much more than look pretty. Elizabeth Taylor did not always have control over the material. She was an MGM contract player. Elizabeth never really showed a woman with any kind of social conscience in her film. She was always somebody that was trying to get a man, uh, or she had a man keep a man. But she had also turned in some magnificent performances. In the much-neglected Rain Tree County, for example, in 1956, she breaks your heart, especially in a long scene where she has an emotional breakdown. People begin to look at Elizabeth Taylor then, and it's a point in her career where people are looking what way she's going to go. Taylor was gaining attention not only for her fine performances, but also for her tumultuous personal life. By 1957, she was already on husband number three, but this marriage to producer Mike Todd seemed destined to last. Mike Todd, best known for theatrical extravaganzas and for the huge success of Around the World in 80 Days, was a good bit older than, than Elizabeth Taylor. And a showman, a man with a sense of fun, and their marriage was extremely happy. Like Taylor, Paul Newman was also reaching a critical moment in both his personal and professional life. Paul Newman was four years into his career when, when Cat on a Hot Tin Roof came out. And it had been kind of a, a, a struggle. I'm ashamed, Big Daddy. That's why Newman, I'm drunk when I'm drunk. of course, was myself. signed by uh, Warner Brothers. They wanted another brand. In fact, he was advertised as a second brand. He was one of four really hot new actors who came along in the 50s. James Dean, Marlon Brando, Montgomery Clift. Newman was the fourth. Newman was the, was the tortoise to, to, to these three's hair. This period in Newman's life is a, is, is a rich one, both personally and also professionally. Uh, in 1957, he and Joanne Woodward went to the South and filmed Long Hot Summer. And in January of 1958, were married in Las Vegas, and then almost immediately, within a couple of weeks, I think, um, of, of being married, he goes into Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. So here's a real turnabout in, in a man's life. He's suddenly getting really meaty roles. His first marriage, which ended in divorce, but he had now remarried and had found someone who was a real rock in his life and obviously has been ever since. So things are really looking up for him. By the beginning of 1958, both Newman and Taylor were poised for major stardom. All they needed was the right vehicle, and that vehicle was Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. But how in hell on earth do you imagine you're going to have a child by a man who cannot stand you? Cat's provocative Maggie and the troubled Brick were just the kind of roles actors dream of. For Newman, he saw the brooding and complicated brick would give him a chance to break free of the type of roles his extraordinary good looks had locked him into. The problem with, with Newman all the way through in this, and it's an interesting part of all the roles that he plays, here's a guy who's so almost unnaturally good looking, so handsome, so, so beautiful in a way. He had to find a way to play against that, otherwise he'd just be a two-dimensional character. And in fact, that was his real problem. Once filming began on March 22, 1958, both Newman and Taylor dove into their roles, each drawing on their own experiences to help them develop their characters. For Newman, the strained relations with his on-screen father, Big Daddy, had parallels within his own life. For Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, in which there is a, a, a young man yearning for a relationship with his father and not willing to settle for simply one with superficial blessings to him, that the wealth and the money that family could get, very much mirrored his own experience as a, as a young child, where he 
um, had a very distant relationship with his father, never felt that he had really pleased him. His father died before Newman could make a career for himself and demonstrate to his father that he, was, he had amounted to something. We've known each other all my life and we're strangers. Uh, you own 28,000 acres of the richest. You own $10 million. You own a wife and two children. You own us, but you don't love us. Surrounded by a first-rate cast of supporting players, including Burl Ives, Judith Anderson, Jack Carson, and Madeline Sherwood, Newman and Taylor were electrifying on screen, but never more so than in their moments together. Give me my crutch, Maggie. Lean on me, baby. To those on set, it was readily apparent that both Newman and Taylor were turning in unforgettable performances and that Cat was destined for considerable success. But then, a tragic event threatened to bring Cat on a hot tin roof to a halt. On March 22, 1958, Elizabeth Taylor's husband, Mike Todd, was killed when his private plane, the Lucky Liz, crashed in the remote mountains near Grants, New Mexico. And you know, she was supposed to be with him in that plane and she felt like she had a heavy day the next day at our um, shoot. And, um, and so she said, no, you go and I'll stay here. I, I remember that we went to MGM and we were told that they were going to suspend um, filming. They weren't sure for how long. In spite of her overwhelming grief, Elizabeth Taylor forced herself to return to work to finish the film she began so joyously only a few weeks before. There is a picture there was a photo they took. They took it right off the bat, the very first day we were there, on the steps, graduated, all of us. And that's, that photo says it all about Elizabeth. She looked so grief-stricken, so sad, and yet so contained. In a way, being forced to go back to work might indeed have been good for her. It gave her a purpose. But it was a deeply unhappy uh, time uh, from which it you know, took, took a great deal out of her as well understandable. You know, Elizabeth, she, she's such a pro in whatever she does, in the best sense of that word. And she never let her fellow actors down, or her director, or her crew. When Cat on a Hot Tin Roof reached the screen in September of 1958, it was everything everyone hoped it would be becoming one of the year's biggest sensations. And at Oscar time, it was honored with multiple nominations. Six nominations, Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Actress, Best Script, Best Directing, and Best Color Photography. With each earning a well-deserved Oscar nomination, no one benefited more from the success of the film than Paul Newman and Elizabeth Taylor. Well, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, of course, was one of the major films in Elizabeth Taylor's career. You know, here, here is an actress in her late 20s who is at the peak of her, her commercial success, her stardom, her beauty, and her ability to undertake very difficult roles, very difficult roles. And uh, one, has to, one has to appreciate that this was never easy. Taylor would follow her role in Cat with another Tennessee Williams heroine in Suddenly Last Summer in 1959, for which she received yet another Academy Award nomination. In 1961, another nomination would come, this time for Butterfield 8, and this time, Elizabeth Taylor would take home the Oscar. Maggie, the cat is alive! I'm alive! Why are you afraid of the truth? Truth! For Newman, Cat proved a lucky film as well, and its success emboldened him to keep fighting for better roles, a fight he would ultimately win. At the end of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Paul Newman is in a really great position, another, another springboard. He's, um, he's going to make uh, uh, the Young Philadelphians, uh, Sweet Bird of Youth, The Hustler, which is going to be a signature movie for him, and Hud, another, another signature role. So that suddenly he, he really is, he, he was able to capitalize in a way that not every actor is able to do on this, on this great success that he's just had. In the decades since its first production, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof remains one of Tennessee Williams' most frequently revived plays, and the remarkable performances of Paul Newman, Elizabeth Taylor, and the rest of the cast continue to remain as fresh and vital as when they first loomed large across movie screens worldwide in 1958.